Well, I am reading through Jeremiah, so that means you are too. Let's go to Jeremiah 42. <laughs> Jeremiah 42, verse 1. Then all the captains of the forces, and Johanan, son of Kareh, and Jenaniah, the son of Hashiah, and all the people from the least even to the greatest came near, and they said to Jeremiah, the prophet, let, we beseech you, our supplication be accepted before you and pray for us unto the Lord, your God, even for all this remnant. For we are left but a few of many, as your eyes can see. That the Lord, your God, may show us the way that we should walk and the thing that we should do. Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I've heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord, your God, according to your words. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever thing the Lord will answer you, I will declare it unto you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not, even according to all the things which the Lord your God shall send you unto us, whether it's good or whether it's evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Jeremiah, you can hear him. So many years of ministry and they're finally coming to me to hear what God's word and they're promising to do it. Before you get really excited, go back to the first word that we read. Then. Then. You see, they were between a rock and a hard place. They had gotten here through a lot of varied choices that they have made. This is the end of the rope for them. They're hanging on and the crocodiles are below and they've got one knot left and they're hanging on with one hand. God, if you just spare me, I'll do whatever you say. That's what they're saying. So in order to understand how desperate they are and where they're at, we've got to go back. We've got to go back six chapters. Back to Jeremiah 36, verse 1. Just to see what's going on. Remember, Josiah was a good king, and then after him comes Jehoiakim, his son. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a roll of a book, and write upon it all the words that I have spoken unto you against Israel and Judah and all the nations, from the day that I spoke unto you, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. And it may be that, that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. What a God of mercy and grace and kindness and forgiveness we serve. This is hundreds of years of rebellion and idolatry. This is hundreds of years of telling their husband, I am going to go sleep with other men. And God constantly calling them back, saying, come back to me. I love you. I want you to be mine. Hundreds of years of rebellion, deep, dark idolatry of sacrificing their children on little idols. God is calling out to them. And he tells Jeremiah, write these things down. Jeremiah communicates this to Baruch. And he says, you need to go up during the feast time. And I want you to read it to the people. In the ears of the people. Because the leadership isn't listening. I need to, you to say it to the people. And when they go, when Baruch goes. And he reads the scroll to the people. There's leaders in the people that say, we need to go take this to the princes. And they take Baruch and they bring him under the princes and Baruch reads the scroll to these princes in the gate of the city. And the princes say, where did you hear this? And he says, God spoke through Jeremiah and I wrote these words down. And the princes said, we need to talk to the king. All these warnings that Jeremiah had told them. That judgment's coming. That repentance is the only way. And they told Baruch, you need to go hide. You and Jeremiah, go hide. We'll take the scroll. And they take the scroll and they walk up to the king and look at verse 21. 22, sorry. 
Now the king sat in the wilderness, in the, in the winter house. Wow. The king sat in the winter. This is my third sermon preaching this. You'd think I'd say it right. This is the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month. And there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a knife and threw it in the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. And they were not afraid, neither did they rip their garments, neither did the king nor any of his servants that were all around that heard these words. How did they end up between a rock and a hard place? They rejected God's word. Straight up, we are not going to listen to this. And Jehoiakim said, I am not going to worry about God. I'm just going to do my own thing. And you know what God says? You can't get rid of my word. And God tells Jeremiah to write it again. Only add more stuff to it. Oh, and tell Jehoiakim that because he's done this, he will never have an heir sit on the throne. His line is cut off. That was the promise that God made to David. And he's saying to Jehoiakim now, you're done. Your whole legacy, your lineage is done. Judgment. So Jehoiakim rejects God's word. He has no fear of God, no repentance, rejects God's word. How do you end up between a rock and a hard place? You reject God's word. That's one. That's one way. And that started the ball rolling for them. Jehoiakim is trying to be a king and God starts sending bands of raiders from the Syrians, from the Chaldees, from the Moabites, from the Ammonites and every time God's throwing a rock at him, he's not turning. It hits him in the head and he doubles down. And then finally, God brings Nebuchadnezzar and says, this is my tool, it's going to happen. And Jehoiakim serves him for three years only. And then he rebels. And Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes him captive and his children and his wives and all of his family and all the pr princes, everybody, and he takes him to captivity. Look at this, 2 Kings 24, 11. And I'm going to ask you to leave your finger here because first service, I didn't tell them to leave their finger here and they had to turn back and forth. So remember to come back to this point. 2 Kings 24, verse 11. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord. And the treasure, oops, sorry, I started in 13. I gotta remember my glasses. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city, and his servants besieged it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon. He and his mother, his servants, his princes, his officers, the kings of Babylon, took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon, the king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem, and all the princes, and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained except for the poorest sort of the people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon. And look at verse 17. And then the king of Babylon made, made Mataniah his father's brother king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. So God fulfills his word right there. The line's cut off, Jehoiakim, it goes back, and now Jehoiakim's cousin, Mataniah, gets to serve as the king, and God has Nebuchadnezzar put him in charge for the purpose of them submitting to the king of Babylon. Zedekiah is 21 years old, and in his reign, which lasts 11 years, he rebels against the king of Babylon twice. The first time, he hires the Egyptians. And we're coming up to our second point of how do you end up between the rock and a hard place. First one, reject God's word. Second one, right here, Zedekiah, lean on man. Make man your strength. Lean to the world. Look for the world's strength to support you. Don't go to God. Jeremiah told Zedekiah to submit to the chastening of the Lord, to do what God was saying in his life. And Zedekiah chose to rebel against what God was trying to do. And he went and he hired the Egyptians to deliver them from the Babylonians. 
Now they thought when that happened, Pharaoh's army comes up and the Nebuchadnezzar's men, they retreated and they regrouped. And God told Zedekiah, hey, this is a temporary band-aid. It's not going away. Even if you killed all of the men and only had a few men remaining that were wounded, they would rise up and burn the city. God is coming for them. There's no escaping the chief cornerstone crushing them because they refuse to fall on him. Do you understand that? They are rejecting submitting to God. And so God is grinding them into the ground in a way of judgment. And he's using the world to do it. He's using Nebuchadnezzar as his tool to bring judgment in their life because they're refusing to listen. So Zedekiah has made the ruler. He's evil. He's Jehoiakim's cousin. And he's rebelling against God. So when he does that the first time, he comes to Jeremiah and he says, what should I do? And Jeremiah tells him, surrender. And he refuses. He hires Egypt. And Jeremiah tells him, you can't lean on the staff of Egypt. It's going to pierce you. It's going to break. You're going to lean on it like a, like a staff. It's going to lean on you. And it's going to stab you. And you're going to die. Don't do this. Don't go to Egypt. Don't go to the world. Don't go to the help of man. Fall on God. And Zedekiah refuses. And then in the ninth year of his reign, the king of Babylon returns. The ninth year of his reign, the king of Babylon returns. Look at Jeremiah 38. Keep your finger, remember, 2 Kings. Okay? 2 Kings, keep your finger there, but go over to Jeremiah 38. And it's verse 17. So this is after the siege has started and Zedekiah comes to Jeremiah and he says, hey man, um, don't tell anybody I'm talking to you, but is there any word from God? What should I do? Because I'm between a rock and a hard place. What should I do? And then Zedekiah, goes, oh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah in verse 15, he says, oh, sorry, 17. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon, his princes, then your soul will live, and the city will not be burned with fire, and you will live and your house. But if you will not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they will burn it with fire, and you will not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me to their hand and they mock me. How do we end up between a rock and a hard place? Reject God's word. How do we end up between a rock and a hard place? Lean on man. How do we end up between a rock and a hard place? Fear man. Don't trust God. Jeremiah just told him that God said, stay and I'll be with you. Trust, give yourselves up and God will be with you. You'll have a life. And Zedekiah is refusing to do that. Look back with me now to um, 2 Kings 25, verse 1. 2 Kings 25, verse 1. Jeremiah had pled with Zedekiah. He said, I beseech you, please don't do this. Please give yourselves up. Your children will be killed. The city will be burned. People will die. Submit to God. Give up. Stop fighting God. Repent. Turn. Repent. Stop. Turn. Repent. Come back. And look at chapter 25, verse 1. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of that month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came. He and all of his hosts against Jerusalem, they pitched against it, and they built forts against it all about. And the city was besieged until the eleventh year of Zedekiah. And on the ninth month of the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city. And there was no bread for the people of the land, and the city was broken. And all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between two walls, which is by the king's garden. 
And the Chaldees were round about the city, and the king went the way towards the plain. So Zedekiah is running away with his men. And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And all his army were scattered from him. And they took the king and they brought him to the king of Babylon, to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him. And they killed his sons in front of his eyes. And then they pulled out his eyeballs. And they bound him in chains of brass and they carried him to Babylon. Just like God said was going to happen. Read further. All of the house, the king's palace is burned. All the mighty men's houses are burned. Everything is burned to the ground. Only the poorest are left. Rebellion. God is using Nebuchadnezzar as a tool. It is not a happy time. They have rejected God. They have refused obedience to God. But God is merciful. Zedekiah was, was God's tool. And he's bringing judgment. And Nebuchadnezzar, again, raises up another guy to be the governor. He raises him up. We're back in Jeremiah now. Back in Jeremiah, verse 11, chapter 39. We're getting to that then in chapter 42. We're getting there. We're almost there. Jeremiah 39. Verse 11, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away of captive Babylon, the remnant of the people that remained in the city. But he left Jeremiah and a remnant of people there. And Jeremiah was supposed to be taken care of, taken out of the prison, and he was given into the care of, verse 14, Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Sapan, that he should carry him home, and he dwelt among the people. Now, this is the guy... Gedaliah, who's made the governor of the space, of all the people that are there, to keep wine, keep the city and be wine, um, I'm sorry, vine tenders is what they call them. And the poorest of the poor are left, and all they have to do is occupy the city. And Gedaliah is serving as the leader, and Jeremiah is under his care. So they're hanging out together, and they're both serving the Lord, and they're Telling the people to stay and to work and to be God's seed in his city, Jerusalem, so that God can fulfill his word. He's still trying to fulfill his word by having a remnant in the city and keep it occupied and fulfill his word. Remember when Zedekiah fled and they caught him in the field of Jericho and it says the soldiers fled and left Jericho, uh, Zedekiah? one of those soldiers comes back. His name is Ishmael. And he's a lineage, in the lineage back to Jehoiakim. He's one of the royal seed. And he's leading a host of soldiers. And they come back to Jerusalem. And Ishmael comes in and assassinates Gedaliah. And then he takes all the people that are left and he rounds them all up and he kidnaps them and he takes them on the way to Ammonites. Because that's where he had hidden out and that's where he wanted to take everybody. And God said, no, no, no. And so God raised up another man named Johanan. And he has a host, another group of hosts. And he comes in and he says, finds out what happened with Gedaliah. And he pursues after Ishmael, gets all the people Ishmael takes off. Flees. And Johanan is coming back to Jerusalem, comes to Jeremiah, and now we have the then. That's when you read in 42, then they come to Jeremiah and they say, what should we do? In all of Jeremiah's ministry, he has seen occupation, rebellion, rejection of God's word with Jehoiakim. He's seen a chance for redemption, but rebellion again from Zedekiah, leaning to Egypt, Fearing man, compromising God's word, hardening of his heart as he's exposed to God's word. As Jeremiah is preaching to him, telling him what to do, he continually stops listening and continually disobeys. And it hardens his heart to what God's word is trying to get him to do. And he becomes harder and harder and harder to the point where when he is told to his face, I, 
am telling you, stop what you're doing. You're going to give up your life and all your children are going to die and the city's going to be burned. Zedekiah, okay, thanks for letting me know. And he does it anyways. Gedaliah, the assassination, kidnapping, rescue. What should we do? You know what this is? This is a Hail Mary. This is a last ditch effort. What should we do? Go to God. Tell us what he says. What should we do? Jeremiah's answer. Look at 42 verse 9. And he says to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel unto whom you have sent me to, rep to present your supplication before him. If you will still abide in this land, then I will build you and I will not pull you down and I will plant you and will not pluck you up for I repent me of the evil that I've done unto you. This is the Lord talking to them. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon of whom you are afraid. Be not afraid of him, says the Lord three times. For I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand and I will show mercies unto you that he may have mercy upon you and cause you to return to your own land. But if you say we will not dwell in this land neither obey the voice of the Lord your God saying no but we will go into the land of Egypt where we will see no war and not hear the sound of the trumpet and not have hunger of bread and there we will dwell in peace. I'm going to add peace in there. And now therefore hear the word of the Lord, you remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you wholly set your faces to enter Egypt and to go sojourn there, then it will come to pass that the sword which you're afraid of will overtake you there in the land of Egypt. And the famine that you are afraid of it will follow close after you to Egypt and there you will die. Look at verse 18 at the end. And you will enter Egypt and you will be an excretion and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach and you will see this place never again. The Lord has said concerning you, O remnant of Judah, go not into Egypt. No, certainly that I have admonished you this day. What should we do? You guys know Psalm 32, verse 8 and 9? Let's go there real quick. What should we do? What should we do? While you're flipping there, we've all had moms, I think. And we've all been given the eye from mom, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like you do, you're doing something, she's having the girls over for coffee or something, and you're out off in a little distance doing something, and you can feel it. You can feel the gaze, and you're like, you look back, and mom's looking at you like, mm-hmm. Do it one more time, shoes coming off. Right? And God's like, your, your mom is staring at you, telling you, this isn't what I want you to do. I want you to do what I'm saying. Look what God says. The kind of relationship he wants to have with us. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you will go. I will guide you with my eye. That's the kind of relationship God desires to have with us. I will guide you with my eye. That close, that intimate. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which has no understanding whose mouth must be held with bit and bridle. God loves you and he loves me so much. If we don't do what God says, guess what he does? He puts a bit and a bridle in your mouth because he loves you. God chastens you. You know how I know that? Because I have a bit and bridle. I know what it tastes like and I taste it all the time. And it will never leave my life. And I remember when I got my bit and bridle. I even remember my friend shared this verse with me before I got it. It was the Holy Spirit warning me, telling me, don't do this. Repent. Turn. And I was compromising with God. 
Me and God got a deal. It's cool. And God says, mm mm. If you can't follow with my eyes, then I will put a bit and bridle on your mouth. Paul had a bit and bridle, didn't he? He was pursuing after the church, saw the Lord on the road to Damascus, and from then on, he had problems with his eyes. And he even prayed, Lord, please remove this, remove this. And God said, stop talking to me about this. It's yours. Bit and bridle. Eye of the Lord. Which one do you want? As Christians, we have one or the other. There's no other choice. And God prefers that we're led with his eyes. God prefers that we're led with his eyes. This is a last ditch Hail Mary that they're saying. God says, follow my eyes. What do they want to do? Reject him. God says, if you follow my will, I'll be with you. I'll bless you. I'll keep you. I'll lead and guide you, direct you. If you refuse my word, will, and way then I'm going to let life's consequences come and get you. Life's consequences. That's not what God wants. God wants the best for you. He wants your life overflowing and abundant. But if you choose to reject that, the peace that God has promised us through Christ, if you choose to reject that and try to go lean on the staff of man, you reject God's word, you compromise God's word, you refuse to repent when God's calling you out. You're coming to church. You're hearing the word of God. And you're like, yeah, but me and God got this. Thing. No. I'm telling you. Repent. Just like Jeremiah was talking to him. Repent. Fall on the chief cornerstone. Be broken. Before it crushes you. I was just talking to a brother out in the middle of our, of our thing between services. And we were talking about life and stuff. And when you're running from God, you know, let's pretend like I had this vision of a, a person in a robe, like caught underneath the rock and the robe is caught and they're like trying to get away. And it's like the rock is moving, slowly grinding them. And they can either fall on that rock and give up or the rock's just going to crush them. And I was thinking, dude, that's how it is when we're running from God. Our robe is stuck and he's sucking us in. It's like your choice is to repent or die. That's our choice. There's no plan B. That's it. I know God's dealing with stuff in your life because he's dealing with stuff in my life. He's faithful. And I'm broken. And I know, I'm, my prayer this last week, you want to know what my prayer with my guys is? I don't want any iniquity in my life. Go ahead. Pray for that. I want all my things that are broken. I want, I want to know what they are so I can try and pray through them and get rid of them. And I want God to get rid of that stuff in my life. You think praying for pray patience is a, is a hard prayer? My friends in my Bible study were like, are you sure you want us, to, don't you just want us to pray patience? It's like, no man, I really want, I trust God. I'm gonna fall on the rock. I'm gonna fall on the rock. He loves me. He loves me. How do we end up between a rock and a hard place? By rejecting God's word. By falling to man and trying to find, find a solution for our problems. By leaning on what our friends say or what the world says. Or find out, oh, I have money. Or I have this. Or I have that. Leaning on those things. Or, I fear man, so I'm not going to do what God's word says. I'm going to do something else. It all boils down to pride. Rejecting God's call to repentance. Remember, false prophets, they teach what you want to hear. They're going to make you feel great. You know what? I don't need to change. Listen to your pop radio station, the music on the pop radio station. You're living life. It's all you. You be you. It's all good. That is the prince of darkness with a temporary fix, just binding you darkness until the day of judgment, and it's too late. You can either have peace from the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, who with power and authority rose from the grave and says, I've proven who I am and I promise you peace if you do what I say. Or you can go to the Prince of Darkness and get a Band-Aid for your cancer. And God is not joking. These people are at the end of their days. They're afraid. Their lives are on the line. Their children have been starved. They've been starving. They've been burned out of their homes. And they don't know what to do. 
And they're scared. And God says, I know you're scared. Don't be afraid. I'll be with you. Trust me. Do what I say. But you don't understand, God. We're scared. I am with you. Isn't he the source of life? Like what Matt was saying earlier. He's our fountain of life. Where else shall we go? Jesus said, repent. The kingdom of God is near. It is never easy to hear repent. It's never easy. But Jesus is the only way to have peace with God. Everything else is fake. Your only choice is to fall on the chief cornerstone. David. King David. Man after God's own heart. Later on in his life, he's kind of getting comfortable as the king. He's chilling out at the house one day and he tells Joab, you know what? I want you to go out and I want you to number the armies. I want to know how many men we have and I want to know the power and the strength of all of Israel. And Joab tells him, don't do this. This is strictly forbidden. For those of you who don't know, this is strictly forbidden in the Old Testament. God does not want him knowing the strength of man. He wants him to rely on God's strength. For any, any concern that he has, any worry, he could have just asked God, God, I need encouragement. Can you just encourage me? And God would have encouraged him. But instead, David says, no, I want you to go out and I want you to number all the men of Israel. I want to know how many people we have. Joab tells him, don't do this. David presses him and says, you go do it. I'm the king. And Joab goes out and does it. And then the prophet Gad comes to David and says, David, you've blown it. Isn't God the strength of Israel? Why are you counting the men? And David falls on the chief cornerstone. I've sinned. I've sinned. I've sinned before God. And Gad tells him, it's okay. You're forgiven. There's consequences though. You can choose one of three doors. The first door, seven years famine. The second door, for three years you'll flee the enemy. Or the third door, three days of pestilence. Choose which one you want. And you know what David says? I fall on the mercy of God. I don't know which one to choose. God knows the best. I am no longer going to be doing this. I am giving up the reins. I have sinned. And he falls on the chief cornerstone. And God says, three days of pestilence it will be. And the angel of the Lord goes through the land and people are dying for three days. Until the Lord gets to Jerusalem. And God says, stop to the angel of the Lord. And the angel stops and David goes there and he's instructed, now go build an altar there and offer to, the God, to God so the people can worship God knowing that he's the strength of Israel. The place of that altar is a very important altar and I'll let you look it up because it's for kings to search a matter out. And it's to the glory of God to hide something. But I guarantee it's an interesting Bible study. That place becomes very important later on. But David repents and he humbly accepts the consequence of his sin and he calls out to God and says, correct me God, I am wrong and I'm willing to give it up. I'm willing to let you have it all. Go with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It's right after the hall of faith, the whole listing of all these great men and women of God who have served God. And he says this, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Isn't that where the battleground is? Isn't that where we reject God's word? Isn't that where we compromise God's word? Isn't that where we lean on the staff of man and our own understanding? Isn't that where we harden our heart and our mind and refuse to repent? Right in here. Isn't that the battleground? And it's because they became weary 
And he's challenging them, don't grow weary. And he goes on, he says, for you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. That's the bar, you guys. There's no excuse for sin in our life. God's saying, you haven't striven to the point of dripping blood from your forehead against sin. What are you talking about? It's hard. Jesus, God in the flesh, sets the bar right here. And he says, aim for that. I've given you my Holy Spirit. It's in you. You can do it. I am with you. Do not be afraid. What excuse are you going to give the Son of God when you try and tell him like, yeah, but sin, it's okay. Um, you have not striven to the point of dropping blood from your forehead, so you have no excuse. And he goes on, he says, my son, and this rolls right into what we're talking about, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. Fall on the chief cornerstone. Fall on him. If you're in a rock and a hard place, fall on God. God, I'm, forgive me. I'm wrong. I'm repenting. Jesus is talking to the people and he's saying really tough stuff. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood if you want to live. And they're like, what is this guy talking about? And they start leaving him. All the people leave. And he turns to the disciples and he goes, will you leave me also? And what does Peter say? Where are we going to go? Who else has the words of life? So you see, falling on the cornerstone. I may not understand it. I am going to fall on this cornerstone. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to rely on God. What did Jesus say is the answer when you're afraid? When you're trying to have peace with God? Die to yourself. Rely on God. Accept God's word. Lean on him. Trust in him. Do what he says. Don't compromise. Don't lean on man. Don't run to the world. Come to God. Confess what you need and ask him for help. He wants to help us. He wants to be there for us. He wants to answer your prayers and show you that he's there. What did Job say? Job said this. He lost everything. Though he slay me. What did he say? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Why? Because God loves me. I can trust someone who loves me. The Father's love corrects us. And when we try to run away from what God's trying to do in our life, it only puts us between a rock and a hard place. You guys, God wants to do something in your life. And you can learn to follow the Lord by watching his eyes. Or you can get a bit and a bridle. But Jesus purchased you. And he's going to make it happen. Because he doesn't give up on his word. He doesn't sign the contract and then walk away and change his mind. God does not renege on his deals. These guys were. But God does not. We've got to submit to God's correction. There is no plan B. It is only plan A. That's it. That is it. How far does God have to go in your life and in my life to get our attention? To get us to walk with him. You can have a childlike faith. When God says something, you're like, okay, dad, I'm on it. I will do exactly what you say. Or you can be like Zedekiah, Jehoiakim. You can say, I'm not going to listen to God's word. I'm going to compromise with God. Well, did dad really mean that? I don't know if that's really what it means. Maybe God's word doesn't really say it like that. Oh, bit in bridal time. If that's what you want, God bless you, man. I'm not going with you. Because I've learned it's not a good place. Aaron Rawson, true story, adventurer, snowboarder, goes out and does crazy stuff, right? And he went hiking in the desert solo. There's a couple things that are cardinal rules you don't do. You don't go hiking by yourself. You don't go diving by yourself. We all know these things, right? You always have to have a buddy. So Aaron Walson goes out and he'll describe it as, I just went for a walk. It's like walking on the beach. I just went out one day and I was just doing my thing. And he's just living solo, doing his own thing. And he's walking down this really narrow canyon and it's sandy. And then it comes up to the rocks and 
basically this wash and a big boulder had fallen down in it and the sticks had gathered and then there was sand and so he walked out to the edge of the rock and it was like 20 feet down and so he went off that rock and went down to the next rock there was another rock below it and while he was on that rock he got off on the edge and he was like going to hang and drop and when he got on the edge of the rock the rock that had been shoved in the canyon wall for a really long time he did it just right and the rock moved and the rock tumbled, blah, 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 blah. And he was kind of trying to block himself. And when everything came to a stop, guess what? His right hand was stuck behind the rock and the canyon wall. He had 50 milliliters of water, no cell phone, didn't tell anybody where he went, and had no buddy. No hiking buddy. He was down in a little canyon in one of the remotest deserts in the United States, all by himself between a rock and a hard place. He had a pocket knife and a little bit of water. It's not God's will that we should perish. It's never God's will that anyone, the wicked, the righteous, God wants us all to live and have life and to come to him and have life. Jesus said, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. To have us have peace. But there's false prophets that are speaking false peace. Only Jesus has the power and the authority to send peace into your life. Aaron Ralston, stuck in a rock, day and night, for 127 hours until he got to the point where he broke his arms, his bone in his arm, and then he cut through his skin with his pocket knife, put a tourniquet on, and walked out of the desert. Because you know what it came down to? His hand or his life. I guarantee you, when he looks at his hand, he's thinking bit or bridle. That's what I look at in my life. When God allowed something like that to happen in my life, I got stuck. It's like, I look at that, I go, bit and bridle, man. Why can't I just do what God's word says? He's going to have that reminder. His kids are going to grow up. It's, Daddy, what happened to your hand? Let me tell you a story. Jesus is calling us. You don't have to do the hard way. So back in Jeremiah, let's finish our story. Back in Jeremiah, chapter 43. And it came to pass, verse 1, that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words which the Lord their God, for which the Lord had sent him unto them, even all these words, then spoke Azariah, the son of Hushiah, and Johanan, the son of Kerah, and all the proud men saying to Jeremiah, you are lying. The Lord, our God, has not sent you to say, do not go to Egypt to sojourn there. What are you going to do when God's word doesn't line up with what you want to do? What are you going to do? Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you gotta ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. 
Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. And today, I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says, because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.